Uh, and for a number of years, I've been hosting a variety of radio shows dealing with local political issues, as well as all these wonderful paranormal topics that I love so much. And uh, my friend, Mac White, who did the art for that poster, it also did the art for that PSYOP radio and is my co-host on that show. So if you're interested in hearing more about our, my crazy ideas about UFOs and parapolitics, um, that's PSYOP radio is on Sunday night. And is it? Is it yeah. Okay, now, UFOs... You know, one of my favorite researchers who I don't really talk much about in this presentation is John Keel. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with the movie Mothman Prophecies, uh, which was one of his most popular books. Now, he was a journalist. He wasn't a scientist, but he did collect a lot of uh, uh, amazing information that one can find out about the subject through. Um, he actually once said something to the effect of if, if the public knew the truth about UFOs, they'd be throwing their babies out of windows or something ridiculous like that. But the point was he thought that there was a, a significant potential danger uh, with UFOs. And it didn't just have to do with uh, the electromagnetic aspect or the radiation aspect. But um, this, uh, this, these quotes here from an interview between uh, famed UFO researcher Jerome Clark and Jacques Vallée in 1978 appeared in Fate magazine and really kind of sums up a lot of uh, what I feel about UFOs and the dangers associated with them. But it also sums up, I think, the, some of the best approaches, and that is to, to really dive in and really get involved and not just uh, have that kind of standoffish scientific you know, approach. Um, he also alludes to some of the dangers and he, he mentions uh, two researchers that a lot of people don't really know about, Morris Jessup, a.k.a. M.K. Jessup, and uh, Jim McDonald. Now, Morris Jessup uh, talked a lot about the men in black and basically clammed up after he had some encounters with the infamous MIBs. And ultimately, he uh, committed suicide, as did Jim McDonald. Now... I'm not suggesting that UFO research leads to suicide, but what Valet here is talking about is the fact that the phenomena itself seems to have a deceptive quality. It seems to be very manipulative and misleading, and if you don't have a strong psychological makeup, that can lead to depression and ultimately, in the case of these two uh, individuals, suicide. Now. Interestingly enough, years later, another researcher that would be added to the list uh, that some UFO researchers keep of people that have been silenced by the mysterious men in black or uh, the sinister forces behind UFOs was an Austinite named uh, Ron Johnson, Gerald Johnson. He was a real skeptical guy, and he was working for uh, Hal Putoff. For those of you not familiar with that name, Hal Putoff, Hal Putoff was the one who uh, started the remote viewing program back in the 70s at the Stanford Research Institute and has since gone on to research things like zero-point energy right here in Austin. His assistant was Gerald Ron Johnson. And one day they were uh, at the Society for Scientific Exploration Conference, which was occurring here in Austin. The previous night, Hal and Valet and... Uh, Johnson had had a really nice conversation about UFOs. They were all friends. But the next day, Ron keeled over, mysteriously some say, uh, while a presentation was being given at this SSE conference. Now, Ron didn't do drugs, didn't smoke or drink. If anything, he was probably a workaholic, so perhaps it's easily to write it off as that. But, of course, as is... So typical in the UFO field, it's kind of become embellished, and uh, he, his name has been added to that list of people that some folks uh, believe were silenced. I know that years later I was told that he had been considered as the potential next head of uh, the Mutual UFO Network, which would have been an interesting turn of events because as skeptical as he was, he would have been a, a very distinct departure from a lot of the other uh, 
believer-oriented MUFON directors that have come and gone. But let's see if this clicker, there we go. Now, I think of UFOs not as so much dangerous as uh, they are a, a opportunity to educate about uh, these strange phenomenon. And again, Jacques Vallée, my favorite UFO researcher, has uh, made several points to that effect that the UFO, the UFO phenomenon can serve as a teaching mechanism. It certainly is a perfect opportunity for scientists to uh, express to the public how science is supposed to work. Scientists are supposed to be there to help us understand little understood phenomena. And yet, as he says, uh, the sightings put into question both the structure of our society and the laws of our physics and we're free to run away from them just as science is doing. Um, he went on to more recently uh, say, by denying the reality of the reports, brushing aside the witnesses and treating them like fools or crooks, the academic skeptics are actually teaching the public that science is impotent at studying the phenomenon. Now recall, Valet, one of the things that drove Valet to research UFOs was when he was in France, and working at an, uh, uh, a telescope with astronomers, they had recorded some UFOs on tape. And he watched as the astronomers destroyed the tapes because they didn't want to deal with the unknown that they were faced with. And that had a profound effect on him, and rightfully so. And thankfully, he went on to uh, continue to research the subject. Another person that suggested the UFO phenomena might represent a sort of teaching mechanism is the voluminous paranormal New Age writer Brad Steiger. Um, in one of his books, he outlined, as so many researchers like to do, all the different possibilities that UFOs uh, might represent as far as explanations for their origins. And uh, this is one that I thought was apropos. He suggests that they're a reality game theory and that, that in the, uh, as he says, in the teasing fashion of a Zen riddle or a Sufi joke, he theorizes a higher intelligence may use such highly improbable teaching aids as monster sightings to provoke us into a higher consciousness and a much broader view of reality. And that's a theme that comes up over and over again from many different researchers. The idea that whatever the UFO phenomenon is, it's actually having a long-term effect on us that isn't as simple as them doing a hybridization study or trying to come and get soil samples or uh, study our culture. Now, I consider myself a Fortean and an anomalist. A uh, Fortean after Charles Fort. Charles Fort was someone who lived in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and was a collector of strange reports. He's also famous for saying that he thought we were property because of all the strange phenomena he had observed. And one of the things I like to use most is I use the UFO as a launching point to talk about all these subjects. Because as he says, one measures a circle beginning anywhere. And uh, this, the, the whole quote there has to do with his interest in strange phenomena like falls of fish and frogs from the sky. We shall pick up an existence by its frogs. Um, these things actually happen. And while they may have prosaic explanations like water spouts picking up frogs in one location and depositing them miles away elsewhere. Um, a lot of times it doesn't seem as clear cut as that and it seems to imply this phenomena that you hear a lot about in paranormal circles of uh, teleportation, aports, materializations. There's been a lot stranger things that have fallen from the sky than just fish or frogs. And blood and guts in fact. Um, but Charles Fort is one of those people who basically said, look, the, here's the data, the damned data, as he said, that flies in the face of scientific understanding. And it's these things that science should be trying to grapple with instead of just sweeping under the rug as being, oh, it's an anomaly and it doesn't, it, you know, it, it doesn't fit our paradigm, so let's not even try to deal with it. And of course, an anomalist is someone just that, that tries to grapple with these different types of anomalies. Now, Anomalistics is another word for, this, for anomalists coined by anthropologist Roger Westcott. Uh, Marcello Truzzi, who you see there, 
was a, a really exemplary skeptic. Um, he started this magazine called The Explorations, and eventually he helped found uh, PSYCOP. I don't know if everybody's familiar with that. They've changed their name since then, but the CSICOP, the uh, Committee for Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal. These are the arch-debunking skeptics that believers love to hate, uh, that are often represented by people like Penn and Teller or James Randi. Um, these are the people who basically don't believe that paranormal phenomena can exist, and so they go out of their way to try and debunk them. Now, the best of them aren't that. The best of them are like Marcella Truzzi, an actual uh, skeptical seeker, somebody who recognized that science you know, needs to try to grapple with these things and not just be dismissive of them. Um, he also, he basically ultimately got excommunicated from the PSYCOP group and founded the Center for Scientific Anomalies Research and uh, published the Zetetic Scholar, which was originally the tagline to the uh, Skeptical Inquirer, which was the PSYCOP magazine. Now, there's a lot of different ways one can approach this, and I guess you could sum up the approach that I take as being postmodern, um, and that's just simply a, a way of looking at these phenomena outside of old frames of references and realizing that there, every way of looking at something is a social construct. Um, Jacques Vallée is often credited as being one of the first real postmodern ufologists because of his work on uh, investigating tales of uh, fairies, um, uh, angels, and other entities, other strange encounters that up until that most researchers had not chosen to look at. They were simply looking at UFOs as uh, extraterrestrial craft and the occupants as extraterrestrials. But he thought that he sensed in the narratives um, similarities to past experiences that humans have had now, some other areas that uh, touch on this are systems theory, looking at things holistically, uh, looking at things cyber-biologically. In other words, looking at the effects that this phenomena is having on humanity, looking at how it fits in to our culture, our history, our storytelling. And I think some of the better ways of looking at uh, these phenomena is from a symbolic perspective, looking at them from a folkloric or anthropological perspective, and looking at them from a mythic perspective, but also understanding the, par the parapsychological data, which we'll look at in just a little bit. And again, I, I think that this phenomena has been with us throughout history. You know, there's a lot of people who put stock in the ancient astronaut theory that believe firmly that extraterrestrials physically came here and interacted with human humanity, or even seeded it, created it as a slave race, uh, in, in some people's opinion. Now, there's a, a lot of different photographs and cave paintings and other ancient artifacts that one can look at with an eye towards, well, doesn't that kind of look like one of those big-headed, black-eyed aliens? Um, Turkish ufologist Farah Uderzu has that photograph down there of the uh, stone eye icons that are uh, prevalent in different parts of the world. And of course, angels and, and demons uh, and the fairies, as mentioned, have all been possible precursors to our modern experiencing of UFOs and presumed extraterrestrials. Now, jumping back briefly to the dangers of close encounters, uh, 